วยHe knows it. And good evening, everybody. Welcome to Bible Baptist Church. Thank you for coming today. I want to remind you that tonight's communion, so if you need to scoot back or, or if anybody needs one of the 
elements. You can raise your hand and Gore can bring them to you. John, over here. Okay, let's open up. Uh, let's stand first and open in prayer. All right, let's pray together. Father, thank you for the privilege of being able to serve you and worship you again tonight. Thank you for giving us another day uh, where we can gather together uh, with our brothers and sisters in Christ. And I uh, thank you, Lord, that we can worship you tonight. Thank you that you are present. Thank you that you are receiving unto yourself the worship that we offer. And I pray that by your enablement, by your power, and through your spirit, we would truly bring glory and honor to you. And we ask your blessing in Jesus' precious name. Amen. All right, take your hymn books, please. Turn to hymn 308 as we begin our communion service. Nothing but the blood. We'll sing the first two verses at this point of hymn 308. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my pardon this I see, nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my cleansing, this my plea, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And you may be seated. I'd like you to take your Bibles and turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. In our series in Jeremiah, we've been talking a lot about repentance and the word turn, a Hebrew word that is used uh, with many meanings, uh, challenging Israel or Judah to turn back to him, uh, and then eventually returning from captivity, and so this, this word is used a lot. So I want to take a few minutes tonight looking at this text here uh, as we think of repentance. There was a time in the New Testament church when a church that was in the midst of a very sin-soaked city, Corinth, um, had a problem in their midst that had to do with sexual immorality, and they were not responding properly. And so that's what the basis when Paul wrote 1 Corinthians, he addressed that issue. And he, he got very specific in chapter 5. And he really laid into them. Uh, he said, your glorying is, is not good. Know you not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? And he really came down hard on them. And now we believe that he is in this text, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, uh, he is referring to uh, when he sat down to write that first letter and address this issue, and he picks up in verse 8. So let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 7, beginning of verse 8, because the word repent, repented, repentance is found several times in just this text. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, and verse 8. Paul says, For though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent, though I did repent. For I perceive that the same epistle hath made you sorry, though it were but for a season. Now I rejoice not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed to repentance. For you were made sorry after a godly manner, that ye might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation not to be repented of. But the sorrow of the world worketh death. 
And then he goes on talking about how they, they were sorry, but they demonstrated, demonstrated the real fruits of repentance. Look at verse 11. For behold this selfsame thing, that you sorrowed after a godly sort. And then he uses all these terms to describe what they did and how they demonstrated their great remorse for what they were doing. Yea, uh, what carefulness, and the idea of that is anxiety, it wrought in you. Yea, what clearing of yourselves. Yea, what indignation. Yea, what fear. Yea, what vehement desire. What zeal. Yea, what revenge. These are all passions and emotions uh, that, like, for example, we're talking about Jeremiah. These were things that Jeremiah did not see in the people of Israel and God's people. These are the things that he was praying for. These were the things that would have given him some solace that these people really were sorry for their sins. They went through the motions, but not the Corinthians. Uh, in all things, ye have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. Uh, I believe it's five, one, two, three, four, five times the word repent is used in this text. And it's all the, it's all the same Greek word, or at least the root word. But clearly by the context... And then also by the, 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 um, the way the form of the Greek word is used, uh, there's two words in verse 9 and 10, the two words repentance. In other words, verse 9, I rejoice not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed to repentance. For you made sorry after a godly manner that, it might, you might, that ye might re uh, receive damage by us in nothing. In other words, we, we didn't end up hurting you by that letter, which there was a risk. But that repentance is, is what we talk about as, as repentance, when someone says you need to repent. And then verse 10 is that word again, and it's, it's the same form, but this is, what he's, this is what he's getting at. This is biblical repentance. Verse 10, For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be, and then you see repented again, but that second time, along with the first two times that the word repent is used, there, it's a different form of the word, and, and clearly from the context, you could also use the word in these, the word regret. So let's go through it and look at it this way. Uh, Paul said, For I made you sorry with a letter, but I do not regret it, is the idea. Paul is not saying, you know, he's not talking about the repentance he was looking for in them, because he did not do anything wrong in writing that letter. He took some risks, because if they didn't respond right, it would hurt their feelings. He might lose friends, uh, but he knew, you know, the, the biblical repentance as far as Paul sinned. And when, so he says, well, I did not repent, I do not repent. The idea of that is, I don't regret it, though I did regret it. That's the idea of that. I do not repent, though I did repent. So it's, it's more of a milder way. He was talking about, you know, he kind of regretted it at first, the way you, you know, I would use that. And then in verse 10, the, the first word repentance is, that, is the basic form of that word, which is repentance. But the second one would also be that idea of regret. So look at verse 10. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be regretted. In other words, this is, when somebody genuinely repents, they, there's, there's not regret. You know, they get right with God, and the fruit is there. And that's what Paul was looking for. That's what Jeremiah is looking for, which we'll look at later. But I want to talk about this issue because Paul, again, he's writing this. He's telling you what went on in his heart when he sat down to write 1 Corinthians, specifically most people believe verse chapter 5, where he really hit them hard about this issue. You know, you're glorying, you're puffed up. You, you, you should be mourning about this. He really laid into them. Uh, and as he's writing it, you can imagine, he's like, ah, I don't know, should I be this strong? But you know what, Here, here's the thing. When, and there will come times when you will need to lovingly confront someone. Someone you love, someone that it would be in your position to do that. Uh, it would be appropriate, it's not always appropriate. Sometimes things need to be said to someone, but who says them is the right thing. And, and here's, where I, here's what I want to get at tonight. There are times when people will confront someone, you know, they will reprove, rebuke, and exhort because the other person is in error. But your motive is key. Notice Paul. Paul was, 
Paul was concerned about their spiritual walk with the Lord. And he had that tenderness. You know, there's some people that they rebuke, and it's like they're glorying in it. And here's, here's what I'm getting at. When Paul wrote 1 Corinthians and, and you know, almost regretted it, he cared about them. He was concerned about their spiritual well-being. He was not, and sometimes I've heard people that confront someone, and the only reason they're confronting them is because they're irritated by what that person does, you know. And, and Paul was not writing like, man, this is a real hassle to me. This, you know, I am really irritated by this because their sin you know, made it inconvenient for him. All these people are coming to me, and all these people, now i got to deal with it. That wasn't what Paul was saying, and this comes out in this, this part here. So I want to ask you something. First of all, have you ever lovingly confronted someone and made sure that your motives were right? Remember what Galatians 6 says? Brethren, if a, if a brother be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one, in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. In other words, you and I ought not to be like laying into people and saying, you know what your problem is? You know, it just shows that we're irritated. We're not really caring about their walk with the Lord. And isn't that what it really the bottom line is someone's walk with God? Now, with that in mind, may you and I lovingly, when it is our place, risk hurting someone, telling them what they need to hear if it's our position. I mean, if it's our place to do that. Uh, because, folks, there's nothing more loving we can do. And we may lose friends. We may hurt their feelings for a time. And maybe even till, till eternity. But you know what? You and I will never regret when you and I lovingly confront someone. And tonight, because we're having communion... The Lord is confronting us, is he not? He is, he is uh, Psalm 139, giving us an opportunity, as David said, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and see if there be some wicked way in me. Uh, nobody has to come up to us tonight, you know, before communion and say, Hey, I want to tell, tell you something that I notice you're doing wrong. This, the only time tonight for that is right now. It's the Holy Spirit to do that. So let's have a few moments of, of prayer before we share together in the bread. And as the Lord brings things to your mind, uh, anything that might be hindering your fellowship with the Lord, let's just confess it and praise God for the blood of Christ. Let's pray. pray. Father, we thank you for your lovingly confronting us through your Spirit. Uh, your Spirit convinces us of sin, judgment, righteousness. And I pray, Father, that as David prayed of old, that you would search us tonight Search our hearts. See if there be some wicked way in us. But Father, we don't want it just brought to our attention. We want you to lead us in righteousness. We want to have that passionate response that, that the Corinthians had uh, so that we deal with these things. Uh, your, it is the, your goodness that leads us to repentance. And so tonight, Father, because Jesus gave his body to be broken for us. Because Jesus shed his blood for us, we can get right with you. We can have put that under the blood and, and continue our fellowship with you. So, Father, may that happen tonight. We pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. All right, I'm going to give you half an hour to um, open up the little contraption thing there. And I am going to, um, I'm going to read from it. You know, normally when I, when I share communion, I, I tend to stick with what's familiar to me. And I always, almost always quote 1 Corinthians 11, 24 and 25. That after the same manner, you know, that, that whole thing, I, I've done that. And, and many years ago, and Jane's not even here. Maybe I feel liberty to share it. Many years ago, Jane said, you know, did you ever think about using one of the other scriptures about that? And I thought, yes, I, you know, I have thought about that. And so I was, uh, even if I, I didn't know Jane wasn't going to be here tonight, uh, but I'm going to read a different text of Scripture. Don't worry, it's still Scripture, and it's still the Lord, uh, you know, sharing the, the Last Supper with his, with his disciples. And it's in Luke 22. You're welcome to uh, look at it. 
And there's two verses there, but here's why I'm giving you a heads up. Now remember, while I'm talking, I'm giving you an opportunity to open the, the juice and the bread, okay? But in, um, in Luke 19, or 22, 19, it's very similar to the passage I'd read in 1 Corinthians because at the end of verse 19, Jesus says, this do in remembrance of me. And that's our cue, that we eat the bread. But in verse 20, he doesn't say, in this text, uh, he doesn't say, this do in remembrance of me. So it's going to like stick in the air and, and we're all going to wonder what to do. So just follow my lead. After I'm done reading that verse, we'll share it together in the juice, okay? Pretty simple, right? Okay. All right, let's share, take the bread together. And again, we're uh, in honoring what the Lord did. In Luke chapter 22 and verse 19, the Bible says, And he took bread and gave thanks and break it and gave unto them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. As we move to the juice, and I read verse 20, Jesus said, Likewise also, the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. You did it. You succeeded. All right, let's go back to hymn 308, and we'll close this communion part of our service with verses 3 and 4. 308, nothing but the blood, verses 3 and 4. Nothing can for sin atone, nothing but the blood of Jesus, naught of good that I have done, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me Nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. All right, let's all stand. Keep your hymn books. We're going to sing another song. All right, let's open up to him. 413, Take Time to Be Holy, him 413.
right, just a couple of announcements. Our next quarterly business meeting will be on July 19th at 7 p.m. And I guess it'll be on Zoom also. It'll also be on Zoom. And our next uh, uh, Finger Food Fellowship filed by a panel discussion will be on Sunday, July 30th. Please give us questions or topics that you would like us to address. This time I have the ushers come forward if you take our general opening. <coughs> Brother James, could you say a prayer for all things, please? That song. What it's was it one, called? It's one of the newer ones. It's called The Power of the Cross. Power of the Cross. Was but somebody humming that when he was playing it? You heard that too? Was. Is that you, Jim? No, I never heard really? It. You've heard it before? Yeah. I've heard the tune before. Okay. That would, I'm like, someone's humming it, or I'm just losing my hearing, which <laughs> that was beautiful, though. That was really beautiful. Yeah, I love a, that. It's a good song, yeah. Amen. All right, let's take our Bibles and turn to Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 4. And tonight our text is the first four verses. So when you get there, let's all stand for the reading of God's Word. Please keep praying for Joanne Tomkowitz and Ed Tomkowitz, Joanne specifically for her health. Uh, we would really appreciate that. All right, Jeremiah chapter 4, four verses. This is God's response to the prayer that is laid out in the end of chapter 3. And God says, If thou wilt return, O Israel saith the Lord, return unto me, and if thou wilt put away thine abominations out of my sight, then shalt thou not remove, and thou shalt swear, the Lord liveth in truth, in judgment, and in righteousness, and the nations shall bless themselves in him, and in him shall they glory. For thus saith the Lord to the men of Judah and Jerusalem, break up your fallow ground, and sow not among thorns. 
Circumcise yourselves to the Lord and take away the foreskins of your heart, ye men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem, lest my fury come forth like fire and burn that none can quench it because of the evil of your doings. May God bless his word. Let's bow in prayer. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the things that were written aforetime uh, to the people, the Jews, so that we might learn in their relationship and, and their response to you, that we might learn your ways, that we might have a desire to, uh, to walk in a covenant relationship with you through Jesus Christ. And we'll thank you for it. We ask your blessing tonight. In Jesus' precious name, amen. And you may be seated. All right, let's take our hymnals. We'll turn to hymn 172, A Mighty Fortress, hymn 172. Jeremiah chapter 2, please, if you take your Bibles, Jeremiah chapter 2. As I mentioned uh, already in communion, we are uh, looking at repentance. That is what Jeremiah is preaching. And we ended in chapter 3 last time, uh, verses 22, uh, is, is the challenge that Jeremiah has been preaching. Return ye backsliding children, and I will heal your backsliding. And then from that point on, 22b to verse 25, is a prayer. Now, some people believe, or some, some theologians will say, this was, you know, Jeremiah was giving a prophetic prayer that would eventually come from the people of Israel's hearts. That They would pray this. Some others, probably a good amount of others, believe that it's actually a, kind of a template that Jeremiah is saying, you know, here's what you can pray. Here's what we're looking for. Um, you know, much like Paul, when he wrote the letter to the Corinthians, uh, you know, he's saying the way you're responding is wrong and, and you need to repent. 
You need to put this, you know, you need to put this brother out. They're, you need to take this serious. And, and many believe that Jeremiah is giving them actually like a prayer, um, not, ju- not to just vainly repeat, but, you know, if you want to get right with God and you want to make sure you're communicating the right thing, here's what it is. So that 22b to verse 25. Now, beginning in chapter 4, verses 1 through 4, is God's response to Israel. And there's two parts, uh, and it all has to do with repentance. The meaning of repentance, the first two verses, he lays out, and he's spelling, uh, you know, what, 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 what does real repentance mean? And then in verses 3 and 4, he's giving the conditions of true repentance, and folks, repentance is the ground for us to start fresh. And that's what God gives his people. Uh, he is the God of second chances. He wants us when he's trying to get our attention. Uh, he wants us to come to him. He wants us to repent. And so the title of the message tonight is Starting Fresh. And uh, we're, we're going to just jump right in. Uh, and the problem that Jeremiah is dealing with is the same problem that Isaiah dealt with and David de- or Daniel dealt with, uh, uh, with uh, um, Hosea. In fact, Hosea uh, is very much the same message, uh, except he had the harder task of being a living illustration of what Jeremiah is preaching about, you know, an unfaithful spouse. And, and he, was, he had to marry uh, Gomer, a, a prostitute, uh, so these are all similar things. So now, uh, the meaning of true repentance. Look at chapter 4 and verse 1. Jeremiah says, or God says, If thou wilt return, O Israel, saith the Lord, return unto me. And if thou wilt put away thine abominations out of my sight, then shalt thou not remove. So he's, he's giving us the meaning of true repentance. And this Hebrew word for turn is plays a big part in this text. He's telling the Jews, you need to return to me, if thou wilt return, O Israel, uh, return unto me, and if you want to do that, thou will put away thine abominations. And that's a term that uh, in the Old Testament, Hosea, several of the prophets use to specif- specifically refer to the, uh, the pagan idolatry of the Canaanites. They were an abomination. And that, of course, is what Jeremiah is talking about. So here's what genuine repentance is. It's exactly what Paul was writing about in his letter. It is sorrow for what you've done, but sorrow that brings a change. And you remember all those terms in in Corinth, you know, what what vehement desire, what zeal, uh, you know, what revenge. They, They were passionate when they finally got right when their heart got right with God, they were willing to do whatever it took to demonstrate that they were sincere. And that's what God is looking for. If thou wilt return, O Israel, saith the Lord, return unto me. And if thou wilt put away thine abominations, that's so there's a condition. You know, you really want to return to me. You are going to, uh, you're going to need to get serious. You are going to need to demonstrate that, um, you know, that you're serious about it and that you want to return to me. Verse 2, And thou shalt swear, the Lord liveth, in truth, in judgment, and in righteousness. And thou shalt swear, the Lord liveth. That, that phrase, as Yahweh lives, is the, the literal Hebrew there, uh, is, is a phrase that was a common formula, if we could say that, of ancient Israel. That, um, that would be used often, and it was never intended to just be an empty saying. It was something that they would say to demonstrate that they were sincerely you know, honoring God as Yahweh lives. In fact, one of the Ten Commandments was that they were not to take the Lord's name in vain. And, and, and the idea of that is they were not to take God's word lightly. When they used the word Yahweh, they needed to, to not only use it with respect, but they, in a sense, they were really acknowledging the sovereignty and the control of Yahweh over their life. And that went with that phrase. And the re- one of the reasons Jeremiah is using it is, remember, he just gave the, maybe just gave the formula for repentance. 
in, in 20, cha chapter 3, verses 22b to 25. He just laid out, much like some of the Psalms, like Psalm 51. You know, Psalm 51 is probably one of the best confessional prayers. In other words, if you uh, want to, if you can't find the words to tell God you're sorry about something, you go to Psalm 51. That's where David got right with God when he committed all his sin and cover up with Bathsheba and Uriah and all that. And it is a heartfelt cry to God. Uh, and, and so many times I'll, I'll go and use that phrase, I'll use that prayer. And, and that's good. And that's kind of like what Jeremiah 3, the last section of that, was for. It's like, okay, you, you're having trouble finding the words to say, here's what I'm looking for. And the words were so chosen, chosen that they would properly describe a sorrowful, repentant heart. Now, can they be prayed without having a sorrowful, repentant heart? Of course. You know, how many people use just vain repetition and they just spout off prayers, which are never meant, you know, at least by God, prayers, even the Lord's Prayer was not given to just, you know, vainly repeat it as some potion or whatever. But it's, it's to give us words so that we can communicate to the Savior. And that's exactly uh, what he is saying. Thou shalt swear the Lord liveth in truth and judgment and righteousness. Those three things are often found throughout the, the prophets. Uh, truth, judgment, and righteousness. And the nations shall bless themselves in him. And the idea of that, the nations shall... When Israel gets right with God properly, and they put away their idols properly, then that would be a witness to the world around them and even the pagan nations would glorify God. What an amazing thing. What an amazing thing. It is much like, I'm thinking of uh, Matthew 5, 16. Jesus said, let your light so shine before men that they may what? See your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. Philippians 1.27, Paul said something similar. He said to the, the Philippians, he said, let, only let your conversation, let your life be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. And then he said, so that whether I come and see you or not, I may hear of your affairs. He's saying, in other words, listen, live, so your life is consistent with the gospel. And then I'm going to hear about it. Not from them, but from the people that witness them. And that's, that's how we glorify God. People are looking at us. People are judging our God based on our passion or lack of passion for Him. And then it says at the end here, and the nation shall bless themselves in him, and in him shall they glory. And then in verse 3, trying to move along here, 4-3. Wait a minute, let me back up. I missed the, uh, at the end of verse 1 is what I'm looking for. If thou wilt return, uh, O Israel, saith the Lord, return unto me, and if thou wilt put away thine abominations out of my sight, then shalt thou not remove. That's what I want to talk about for a minute. Then Thou shalt not remove. In other words, he's saying, if you, if you really mean business, you're going to put away the abominations, you're going to get rid of the idols, and you're not going to waver. Now let's go back to that letter we read from Paul um, with the Corinthians. You know, Paul was writing that letter, and, and there was, remember he said, I, I, you know, I might regret this, because he knew that he could hurt them. Anytime you confront someone lovingly, and you're addressing their sin, there's always the possibility that they're going to get offended. And that happens too many times. But remember, remember that verse in Proverbs, faithful are the wounds of a friend. Contrast that with the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. See, sometimes you and I would think, well, I'd rather have people say nice things to me than say negative things to me. But that verse is saying just the opposite. If there's hard things that need to be said to us, and the appropriate people say them to us, they are wounds, but they're faithful. Compare that to somebody that just says nice things to you, but, but is talking about you behind their back. 
and that kind of thing, the kisses of an enemy, what are they? They are deceitful. God is lovingly confronting these people. But he doesn't just want lip service. He wants heart service. In fact, um, what Isaiah said about the Jews, Israel, uh, is so true as well. In Isaiah 29 and verse 13, in fact, Jesus quoted this in Mark 7 and verse 6. Here's what Jesus said. He answered and said unto them, he's talking to the Jews, Well hath Isaiah, Isaiah's prophesied to you of you hypocrites, as, as it is written, This people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And that was Judah. That was the people that he was addressing, that Jeremiah is addressing. And he just wanted them to demonstrate that they meant business. The proof is in the pudding. Some people, when, when you address, you ever get the feeling that somebody that continues to do the wrong thing, uh, and maybe you bring it up to them, and, and this is, again, going back to what I talked about during communion, and they get irritated. And maybe they'll say something like this. Hey, come on, I said I'm sorry. What more can I do? You know, instead of looking at that and saying, okay, maybe I'm not showing the fruit that convinces this person. So whose problem is it? Well, if I'm irritated at them, I need to kind of step back and say, why are they bringing this up in my life so many times? Instead of being reactionary, we need to be willing to change. Change is so very hard. You know, and, and I, I was thinking recently of, I guess it was last week's text. Remember, uh, they were crying from the high, the, the high hills, the, you know, the places where they used to worship their false gods, and they're crying to Jehovah. And, and it, it very well may be a picture. It may be after Josiah's reforms where they destroyed all the altars, but apparently they still kind of went through the motions of their pagan Canaanite worship, but they were crying to God. Remember the contradiction between where they were and what they were saying. Uh, so they apparently they may have very well just stayed in the old patterns of the old ways. That's interesting. You know, we use the phrase ruts. You ever been in a rut? Um, I came across this interesting tidbit, and from researching it, uh, it's, it's, it's just fascinating. I could not find anything that would re refute this. It's one of those things like, really? Is this true? So listen to, listen to this article that I came across. The U.S. standard railroad gauge, in other words, when, when you're laying down railroads, the distance between the rails, the standard in the United States is 4 feet 8 and 1 half inches. That's an odd number, isn't it? Why did they do that? Well... That's the way they built them in England. And, of course, when America started, you know, we had all these people from England coming, and so that's the way they did it. That's the way all the, the, the people knew how to do it. So that's why they did it. Okay, then let's ask, why did the English adopt? I mean, that's a weird measurement, isn't it? Four feet, eight and one-half inches. And, and why, so why did England do it? Well, apparently the people who built the pre-railroad tramways Use that gauge. Oh, okay. Well, then that begs the question, why did they do it? Well, they did it because the people who built the tramways used the same standards and tools they used for building wagons, which were set on a gauge of four feet, eight and a half inches. Oh, okay, I get it. Wait a minute. Why... Were the wagons built to that scale? Well, because that's the size. Uh, the wheels, uh, other than that, if they used another size, the wheels would not match the old wheel ruts in the roads. Oh, okay. Well, why were the wheel ruts in the road? Who built the old rutted roads? The first long-distance highways in Europe were built by Imperial Rome for the benefit of their legions, and those roads had been in use ever since. And the ruts were first made by the Roman war chariots. Four feet, eight and a half inches was the width of a chariot, which was used to accommodate the, t the girth of two large war horses. And that's where it all began. So, you know, the, oh, so it all started with ruts? 
and then ruts became roads, and then roads became tracks, and that distance has kind of been imprinted, assuming this is true. I mean, that's pretty amazing, and that gives a great illustration of what a rut is like. You know, in a rut, you just, when you get into a rut, <laughs> it's hard to get out. And apparently Israel, you know, they were, they were struggling, and of course, you and I, we know the end of the story in Jeremiah, is though God gave them chance to repent, they never repented. So jump to verse 4, the conditions of true repentance. For, so at first we had the meaning of genuine repentance, now we have the conditions. For thus saith the Lord to the men of Judah and Jerusalem, break up your fallow ground and sow not among the thorns. We have a bunch of illustrations being used here, which Jeremiah will often do, things that these people can relate to. Um, he is about, the next verse he's going to be talking about circumcision. This time he's using agriculture. And I want to just read to you probably the most concise explanation of what Jeremiah is talking about, which gave a lot of insight to me, uh, was from a particular commentator uh, named J.A. Thompson. And he said this, and he had made a great summary at the end. He said, the instruction here, break up your fallow ground, sow not among thorns. The instruction does not refer to ground that has lain untilled for a long time, and has grown hard so that it must be broken up again. The Hebrew verb refer, refers to virgin soil. The command is therefore to break new soil. No easy task on the rocky slopes of Judea. There was a further problem. Tilled ground encouraged the growth of thorns and thistles. It was normal to collect and burn the tender dry thorns after the harvest had been gathered in, but at sowing time, sowing preceded plowing. The farmer scattered his seed over unplowed stubble on the path among the thorns on rocky ground. Remember the, the, two, the parable in Mark and Matthew? The hole was then plowed in. This may seem bad farming to the Western mind, but it was the custom of centuries in Palestine. The fact was that the ground was infested with thorn seeds despite the fire following the previous harvest, and these were all the more abundant because of years of strong growth in good ground. So that explains some of the, you know, what's going on agriculturally, because, you know, those are farmers who do it our way would not understand that. And then he makes this comment. He said, here's the picture that Jeremiah paints. Judah's own field was so infested with the thorn seed of past evil deeds that her only hope was to reclaim new ground. The whole future was threatened by the legacy of the past, and only a complete and radical new beginning would suffice to save the nation. That is so good. I want to read that again. The whole future was threatened by the legacy of the past. Isn't that good? I love that. Because how many Christians do I know who to this day are stuck in that rut, and again, their whole future is threatened, they have just stagnated. Some have not been to church in years. Why? Well, because they've stagnated by the legacy of the past and only a complete radical new beginning. And that's the idea of the plow up the, fa the fallow ground. Uh, we need to start new. That's the idea. You know, some, some of God's people just need to start fresh. But you know what? Don't let the legacy, don't let the... Um, don't let the future be threatened by the legacy of the past. Again, that picture keeps coming up. And I was even thinking of it recently because I like talking about it because I can relate to it. So I preach to you, you should not be looking in the rearview mirror. And whenever you hear me saying that a lot, it's probably because this guy is looking in the rearview mirror. And it's not a good thing, you know. So, so may you and I start fresh and... and um, and realize that that there's some there's some ground here, but again we need to we need to start new. We need to set aside the those abominations. We need to get things out of our life. There is a there is a, a ad campaign. I think it first came out in in this recent Super Bowl. That's when I first had, heard about it, and it's it's supposed to be a religious message. Maybe you've heard it. it it's it's the, the plug word is, he gets us. You've heard of that? And they actually have a website. And it starts out, 
Jesus loves us without limits. He gets us. And so I looked on the website, and it said, How did the story of a man who taught and practiced unconditional love, peace, and kindness, who spent his life defending the poor and the marginalized... Now, by the way, if you listen, there's, there's some words in here where I, I would stop and say, no, wait a minute, what are you talking about? And this whole ad campaign, on the surface, sounds really good. It's like, yeah, that's right. But I submit to you, when you, when you kind of break it apart and you see the context of, of what's going on in our country today, they're pushing a different meaning. Again, let me read it. How did the story of a man who taught and practiced unconditional love, peace, and kindness, who spent his life defending the poor and the marginalized, a man who even forgave his killers while they executed him unjustly, whose life inspired a radical movement that is still impacting the world thousands of years later, how did this man's story become associated with hatred and oppression for so many people? Now that sounds good, but I, you have to step back and say, wait a minute, are they talking about, like, would, would they be talking about, like, Jeremiah? Because he's calling sin, sin? Would, the, would these people here be saying that the people of Judah are the marginalized because they, all right, you know, they're worshiping this, the Canaanite gods. And then it goes on. This is the love Jesus taught. Selfless love that doesn't come with any conditions or require any payment in return. What? Wait a minute. Now, again, it all sounds good, folks, but what is God laying out to Judah and Israel? And what does God say to us? First Corinthians chapter 5. Was Paul setting some conditions on those Corinthians? He was. He was telling them, you need to repent. You need to be sorry. And that means you need to change your actions. This idea of unconditional, which is what they're, they're pushing here, would not fit in with Jeremiah's message. Listen, as an adulterous spouse cannot continue to hold on to their illicit lover and genuinely return to their marriage partner, so Israel could not return to God but continue to embrace the idolatry that they embraced. I love that picture. I read that in a commentator. commentator and that's what he's talking about, right? You think about that. You think about a, a husband that has been unfaithful to his wife and is... His wife, you know, he comes to apologize to his wife. I am so sorry, hon. And I want to make things up. I want to make things work. And she's glad to hear that. Great, you want to make things work. And she says, okay, but I, I, I'm going to put some conditions down. Wait a minute, what do you mean conditions? You're supposed to love me. Is she wrong for putting conditions down? I. The condition is that you leave your lover... Then I'll know you're serious about it. Would she be wrong to insist that he do that? Of course not. And so, the, you know, God is not wrong in saying, you know, there's some conditions here. And by the way, if you want to experience the love of Jesus Christ, he doesn't force his love on everyone. And folks, there's some day when he's going to say to many people, depart from me, I never knew you. So the condition is he'll take anyone, whosoever will may come, but they need to acknowledge their sinners, repent of their sins, and then he'll save them. So, again, there, there is a, a real challenge there. So verse 6, or verse 4, excuse me. Circumcise yourselves to the Lord. And by the way, Paul picks up on this idea. Uh, we already talked about this this morning in our Bible, uh, maybe morning service actually. Circumcision was a big, uh, you know, religious ritual and right for the Jews. And it had to do with a physical surgery of a physical part of the body. And God is now talking, you know, theoretically or, or um, spiritually. Circumcise yourselves to the Lord. Take away the foreskins of your heart. Ye men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem, lest my fury come forth like fire and burn that none can quench it because of the evil of your doings. So, you know, this whole, I think, the whole idea that Jesus gets us. Are you saying that Jesus gets us and he's okay with our homosexuality and our transgenderism? and all? Are you saying that? Because that's not the message of the Bible. Yes, he loves us. Yes, Jesus died on the cross for those things. But you've got to repent and turn to the Lord to receive that love. Yeah, he gets us. He gets that we're all sinners. 
Some people, so I heard, read this statement as I closed. Some people, some people, I just laid my eyes on this statement. Some people will change when they see the light. Others change only when they feel the heat. Now you look at verse 4, and the Lord is he's putting some heat on them, isn't he? He's, he's, he's making it uncomfortable for them. And folks, by the way, if they did not you know, heed that prayer at the end of chapter 3, and if they did not meet these conditions of genuine repentance, then what was going to happen? He was going to bring judgment. They were going to go into Babylonian captivity, and that's what happens. But, and in a sense, that was how he laid out his fiery judgment. Some people will only will only pay attention when it really affects them. I close with this. I shared this one time. I forget how long ago. Uh, you've heard of a Mercedes Benz, right? Carl Benz um, was a German automobile maker. And in 1886, he drove his first automobile through the streets of Munich, Germany. Uh, he named his car Mercedes-Benz after his daughter, Mercedes. And um, now this was at a time when most people were doing horse-drawn carriages. And people were angry because the, the Mercedes' car was noisy. It scared children. It scared the horses that were pulling carriages around. And so pressured by the citizens of Munich, uh, everybody complained and and so they they established a speed limit for horseless carriages like the Mercedes Benz of 3.5 miles an hour in the city and 7 miles an hour outside. Now he had made this Mercedes Benz to as far as those miles, he had made this Mercedes Benz to really cover some I mean these things were fast according to the standards of those days. But when they made those laws, he he was thinking, you know what? I'm I'm not going to sell anything. I can't have this. Nobody's going to want to buy my. No one's going to want to buy my Mercedes Benz if they can only go, you know, uh, five miles or can't go over seven miles. It's not going to work. So he had a plan, and I love this. He invited the mayor of the town to come and drive in his Mercedes Benz, but he had a plan. He had um, he arranged for a milkman. With his, with, his, with his horse to, to park a little ways. He knew where the route was going to be. And, and it was all time. So the mayor came, got in his car, and he's, he's driving the speed limit, just like the mayor and all the good citizens wanted. And then all of a sudden he had, according to Q, this milk cart guy came out with his horse and like almost ran over the Mercedes Benz. And, and he, he, he whooped it up at the guy, provoking him. And then he took off. And uh, and the the mayor was really mad. He's like, you you got to chase him. You got to get him. And he's like, sorry, sir, speed limit three point five. And the mayor's like, no, you got to get him. And so eventually, he was able to convince Mercedes to speed up to the guy. And then they, after that, they changed the speed limit so that he could sell his cars. But you know, it was only when it affected him personally. You know, the mayor the mayor's happy to sit in his cushy chair. And issue, you know, all these decrees. But when he saw what it meant practically, then he was willing to change. And you know, God will bring uh, the trials of living in our life sometimes just to get our attention. And he's so gracious that way. He's so loving. So is God trying to get your attention? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your loving rebuke. Thank you for the faithful wounds of a holy God who loves us and exhorts us. Thank you for faithful friends who attempt to reach us lovingly. Uh, yeah, Lord, we also realize that you'll put a few of those irritated people in our lives who, uh, who may rebuke us, uh, not out of any true love. Uh, and Lord, we know that you use that as well. But Lord, help us not to be those people. And help us as well. Help us to see how you're such a loving God that we would break up our fallow ground, that we would start fresh, and that that is your challenge. So that means that you invite us to do that. That means you give us the chance at fresh starts. And we thank you for that. We pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen.
Please take your hymn books out. Let's stand and we will close in song. All right, let's turn to hymn 148. God leads us along, hymn 148.
Hello. Some nice you. I'm so sorry. I took them water pills this afternoon. Oh, yeah. It's, it's better for you than, you know. Yeah, I see. You got to go. You got to go. Uh, well, let me change these light bulbs. Let me do some beacon work. What do you want to Oh, uh, yeah, some of them are out over here.